Hey, Facebook land. Uh, we are live again tonight, and I think this is our fourth one that uh, Eric and I have done, and we brought in our good buddy Taylor Laviolette, uh, who Eric and I both love uh, for obvious he's reasons. Great. He's a beauty, and he looks like Freddie Mercury with that mustache on. <laughs> uh, and if you haven't checked out his video, he's got a He's actually got a video on his Facebook page where he's doing fat bottom girls uh, with a guitar, <laughs> looking and sounding like Freddie Mercury, which was amazing. Um, so we're going to get into some stuff tonight because Taylor is uh, has some expertise where Eric and I don't, and he is a pro at uh, orthopedic assessment. And he shared a um, sorry a research article with us, uh, and I'm going to read the first paragraph of this article because. As soon as I read it, I felt like I was in Jerry Maguire, just looking and going, you had me at hello. As soon as I read this intro article, because it says, the majority of persistent non-traumatic musculoskeletal pain disorders do not have a pathoanatomical diagnosis that adequately explains the individual's pain experience and disability. So as soon as I read that, I looked at it and went, you had me at hello, because that's everything that we've been talking about for uh, the last four meetings. Um, but we've got some questions that we're going to talk to Taylor about first um, because, well, everybody needs to get him, get to know him a little bit better. So Tej, if you could just discuss your journey into becoming an RMT with us, because as I understand it, I believe you're also uh, certified as a personal trainer, but I don't know which came first and I could be wrong on that, but uh, I think that's my understanding of you. Yeah, um, actually, the story of uh, myself becoming a massage therapist is kind of an accident, actually. Uh, I wish I had a great story. I don't. Uh, I, Everybody's got a great story. Just tell your story. I was a, I was a primarily guitar player. I, I love to sing and play guitar. And I thought, well, this is a, a great way to make some money and focus on what really matters, the music, right? And then, uh, And then, you know, 14 years later, my guitars are mostly collecting dust. So that's, that's how I ended up becoming a massage therapist. It was kind of an, kind of an accident. And uh, like I said, I just fell in love with something different. So that's how it happened. Nice. So were you personal trainer first or RMT first? No. Uh, during the program, I think when we started taking the therapeutic exercise component, that piece really spoke to me just because um, – just with who I am, I'm the kind of person who always wants to do for myself. And I like empowering information. I guess I just found that the exercise component was something that I could do. And so I really just I heavily identified with that. Which is amazing. Um, Eric, I'm going to let you ask the next question that comes up on uh, the ones that are prepared for him. But before we get into that, um, because Eric and I teach a course on therapeutic exercise, I love that uh, the statement that you just made because I believe that most RMTs or most massage therapists look and go either that's out of my out of my scope of practice or I'm not confident enough yeah. with therapeutic exercise or exercise in general. So we refer out to physiotherapists or to other professionals that that will help people with this. But yet that's well within our scope. So um, how did you go about getting to the point of saying? I'm going to buck the tide or I'm going to buck the system and I'm going to start doing exercise with people as opposed to referring out. Uh, you know, I don't know what to say. I think that at first it really was a bit of that, a bit of that, you know, like you said, bucking the system a bit, I was a little bit atypical and I wanted to do exercise with people uh, as part of my treatment. But then I think over the years, I kind of ended up mellowing down a bit after taking a bunch of, um, exercise-based courses. I took a ton with Liebenson and everything with McGill and um, heavy reading on the subject. And then after a long time, I just kind of sort of, you know, started looking at everything as being the same. So like getting in and out of a chair just looks like a squat to me. So um, <laughs> take these different, these different uh, ways of learning how to squat, lunge, deadlift, et cetera. And to me, it just looks the same as getting in and out of your car, getting in and out of a chair, getting on and off the toilet. How do I help my patients get their pants on pain free? And when I, uh, you know, have all these uh, therapeutic exercise uh, interventions and learn so many different modifications for exercise, it just helps you um, work with people uh, at that level. Well, the thing that I love about that is one of the things that we 
preach and talk about many times in a course is making um, making the exercise you prescribe valuable to the patient. And everything that you just talked about are exercises that are valuable to a patient. Getting up and off the toilet is extremely valuable to people. Getting in and out of the car is extremely valuable to people. So the question always becomes, how do we do it? How do we recommend something that's going to make it so that if their their goal is to be able to get up off the toilet, mm -hmm. uh, that we work towards that. So I love that. I absolutely love that. Uh, so Eric, I'll let you go ahead and ask the the next question that you've got on the list there. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I, I just I'm, I'm excited to have TJ here today too. Actually, I think this is uh, um, we've had really good guests so far, but I think this this is a little this topic's a little bit different. So I think uh, I think I'm looking forward to to, to see where this goes. Um, what I yeah I guess the first thing is is to ask you is I mean I know I know your story I I know part of your part of your journey and I know we all kind of started at this place where we thought we knew everything and uh, we were eventually challenged with um, uh, we were, our, our our beliefs our narratives were challenged and, and and we've all kind of had our own journey to getting to where we are today so I mm -hmm. guess. I guess my, my question for you would be, I just would like to hear your, your story about like, was there any events or was there like a singular event that kind of woke you to start exploring, like thinking differently about like what you're doing and, and, and started making you kind of be more aware of like the science around pain and like the biopsychosocial. Holy moly. Okay. That's a lot of questions. There's a lot um, of questions there. Take your time. I, <laughs> There's a lot of action in there. It's action packed. <laughs> I have to say that the the process was was painful, and it was really slow, and it was lonely. Um, you know, I really really wanted to be the best at assessment because I just figured, uh, without knowing any better, you know, uh, if I could use the assessment tools that I was given in school, and we were given a great great education to start with at school, but I I you know I thought if I could just assess them better, then I could treat them better. You know, I mean, it's a logical um a logical uh, sequence of thinking right um <clears throat> but then the wheels just started to fall off the bus you know like um an example might be uh in my early years thinking that you know i could identify yanda's cross syndromes for example and one of the things that i started noticing that was really tough for me to handle was that okay so i've got this person they've got a cross syndrome and let's just say it's the upper cross syndrome with, you know, the dominance and the pecs and, the, you know, the weakness in the back. And I thought, OK, well, how am I to know if there's if they're requiring more stretching in the front or more strengthening in the back? Well, I'm supposed to use my testing to try and figure this out. So I would do some length testing of the pecs and find out like, OK, well, that can't be the reason because they've got plenty of length in their in their pecs. And then I would turn them over and I would do their rhomboidei and their uh, uh, trap strengthening uh, tests, manual muscle tests, and find out that, well, that's not right either, right? So, you know, what am, I, what am I to do with that and kind of information? It just, it kept, kept falling apart on me. And that's just one example. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's, a, that's a pretty common thing for a lot of us is that things just stop making sense. Because you learn this stuff, and, and you're you're supposed to be able to know it so well, but then when you go to apply it to practice, it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't e it's there's no it doesn't equal like it, there's things don't seem to make sense, and so uh, I think some of us will just keep chasing, keep chasing dragons, keep trying to find this magical thing to to, to <laughs> explain it. But I think some of us, and like yourself, you know, like more and more people are starting to come along and start to realize that like, well, maybe it's maybe it's not that that simple. Maybe there is a different narrative, a different explanation for, for why, why um, these assessments don't seem to be as, as predictable as they're supposed to be as they are in a textbook. Sure. Yeah. And was there a certain amount, Tej, where, uh, because a lot of feedback that I get um, from the blog and things like that is when I present research that, that counter, that is counterintuitive or counteracts what we've been taught, people uh, sometimes get their back up a little bit. So when you're talking about assessing somebody and you've looked at Jonda's upper cross or lower cross syndrome, um, was there a point where you were like, well, like there's this conundrum of what I've been taught and what I'm seeing. And was there like a certain point where you got angry or were like, what I've been taught was not right and went from there? 
Yeah, I, I have to say that um, I like to emphasize this to people that uh, hoping that it can reach them and help them transition a little bit too, because that process was wildly uncomfortable for me. Yeah. I believed deeply and I, I know I learned the special tests uh, in great detail and I took all kinds of extra courses in biomechanics to try and figure this stuff out and explain it. And uh, like I said, that was one of the things that started to, to uh, break down on me was the, the uh, seeing the or the lack of consistency in things like manual muscle testing and length testing and even uh, palpation, right? The first, uh, the first few times I did dissection, uh, you know, a, a good six day dissection, find out that, you know, things aren't where they're supposed to be all the time. Uh, people can have muscles on one side of the body. They don't have on the other. And the and muscles are way smaller than we thought they were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The tissues like all over the place. It's different thickness and texture and bulk and all kinds of stuff. So I think like when I put my hands on people, how am I supposed to uh, then say uh, what's right or what's not right? So I just thought maybe that palpation testing wasn't right. And then we actually it wasn't uh, – far after that that i found soma is simple and then that was just like it was it was a crisis it was a full crisis yeah. and after discussing with a number of those people like greg for example who you know pardon me handed my ass to me many times <laughs> or before i just <laughs> in a better loving way eating no i mean i respond well to that so that that works that works great i mean he was kind he was always just you know i think you should read that paper again kind of thing <laughs> so yeah. it was um a really painful process where I had to give up a lot of things that I wanted to work. And I invested so much time in learning uh, these things. So it was really hard to give them up. And we could, I could go down a total dirt road with your research road with you on this topic. Cause I, th I, th I think there's so many of us that have been through this. I know I've been through it and uh, I know Eric's been through it. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are still going to have to go through it uh, at some point. Uh, and some that won't, some that will refuse to, but it, mm -hmm. it's a difficult road, but it's also a very rewarding road to go down. Uh, True, because when, you, when you come out the other side, um, and granted it happens in stages where you end up realizing a few things and understanding a few things. And when you come out the other side, you're like, this doesn't have to be as complicated as we thought it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think what what happens for all of us is you start to you start to throw everything away and think everything we learned had no value, and then once you come out the other side, you realize there's value to it. It's just a different value than what yeah. you originally placed on it, and there's you can still use all that stuff, but you just have to use it a little bit differently. And I think uh, I think that's that's the key, and I think that's the hard thing to, to when you're trying to communicate this stuff and trying to educate this stuff to other therapists is I think it's very 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 difficult for them to if they haven't gone through the journey themselves and maybe they're depending on where they are if they're early on in the journey or or, or or part way through and they're not at the end it can be very very difficult for them to really understand what the hell you're talking about mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i think that that message is worth repeating you know over and over again yeah um, is that it's it's not that you know uh everything is you know bs or whatever uh, although i think that that's what people can hear and i think that that's what i heard in the beginning too right oh me too it's, we all did <laughs> Going out everything, but then after a while, um, started realizing that it's not that there's no value. It's just like you said. It's that there's just a different value than what I thought, and isn't that great? It's still so, it's still value. It's yeah. just not for what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think that that's a, that's an important thing for anyone that's, that's listening or watching to to really get from that is there is value. So don't throw away everything, uh, but just you know maybe uh, take a, take a chance to look at it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing I, that I was curious about you, because we all we all have our own journey about how we deal with the cognitive dissonance of of these things. What was your? I mean, obviously you're, you you didn't want to believe it at first, but um, what was the like? Was there a specific process you went to before that, that took you to get from? I know all this stuff, and now I don't think I know anything. How did you reconcile that together to 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 still do your job and still enjoy doing what you're doing? <laughs> it was uh it was it was hard and it's still going on yeah it, it's still processing i mean yeah it's not in the past tense at all um i'm still replacing things um uh and that's why i ended up building an assessment course because i was so in love with this particular assessment and you know ortho model and the biomechanical model the postural model all those things meant a great deal to me and then when those things 
as I found out over time, weren't as defensible as I would have liked them to be. I wanted to replace them with something that was as valuable or more valuable. And so that process is still continuing. <laughs> Which is good. I think that, and that's a sign, I think, of, of, a, of a good therapist, too, is that, I mean, Jamie and I talk about this all the time, is that, you know, you, you know, you can never just rest on your laurels and think you know everything. No, right? it's like, a constant we need, realize, process. we need to realize, that I think, and that's the thing I always try and tell people is that if you can make the acknowledgement that you don't know everything and that you're, you're going to, and you're going to be constantly uh, on the search for, for, for knowledge to be less wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no certainty, then I think it allows you to, to, to gain more, uh, more knowledge and allows you to, to, to take in new information rather than just shutting it out. And I think that's really important. And I, I, I my hope is, is that, you know, as a profession or as any healthcare provider, like you have that mindset of like, you can't just close yourself off because you'll, you'll, you'll stop learning. Yeah. yeah. And be stuck in the past. Yeah. And that'll be going on for mm -hmm. as long as we are therapists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's what, well, for what we understand, like, you know, we always talk about the biopsychosocial is our best understanding of pain right now, but five years from now that could change. So we can't, if, and if it was to change, we can't continue to teach the biopsychosocial aspect of pain. It's sure. just that for right now, that's the best understanding we have. And as time goes on, we have to alter that understanding as new research and new information and new experiences of therapists come out. Um, we we got to be able to adapt and change with that. So um, it, it's a never ending process, really. And if I could uh, just add to what you're saying there, Jamie, I think that like some people think that like if we have like you know the patient's experience like this, sometimes when we talk about biopsychosocial, I think that some people think that oh, if we can just if we can just say how much is bio, how much is psycho and how much is social and then just like cater our treatments to that. And that works. I mean, so the using the, I'm really uncomfortable even using the word understanding when it comes to BPS because it's, a, it's, uh, it's humbling. It's, it's crazy humbling. It's people, right? I mean, I know you're already hip to this, but I'm just like reiterating that. No, no, you were just right. Is that, uh, yeah, we, we don't know the complexities of how these things interact with each other. Um, uh, or in what measurement they will be present in a person's case. But we can kind of just maybe use this framework to at least let people know that things that are on the psychosocial spectrum are not abstractly related to their pain, that they mm -hmm. can, can be major participants in it and they just take care of themselves, you know, the whole person. Yeah. Well, the, what's great about the what you just held up, your little diagram there, is that it's it's never three perfect pieces of a pie. Sometimes there's a way bigger biomechanical aspect and smaller psychosocial. And sometimes it's a way bigger psychological aspect. And sometimes it's a way bigger social aspect. Um, it's never ever three equal portions. It's, there's usually going to be one that's bigger than the other two. And we've just got to take that into account and work with patients who are experiencing that. And it's going to be different with every single patient. Um, and it's, and it's going to be different with every single patient on a different day. It's so a lot. It's going to change as that, you know, as your therapeutic relation progresses and as the pain progresses and as that person's environment progresses, it's, it's always going to change and we've got to take that into account. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see what kind of uh, tools we can get over the next however many years to help us be more mentally and emotionally nimble, I guess is the word I'm using to try and flex to these situations. Uh, I don't know. I always like to, I always like to think, uh, use the, 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 the thought of like, or the, the analogy of being like accepting uncertainty. I think when you, when you're, when you're treating it within the, the, uh, uh, biopsychosocial frame, framework, you have to be uncertain because there is no linear correlation between, you know, a plus B doesn't equal C because you don't really know what you're going to get. And maybe you address more of the bio and, but maybe that's, that's only a small portion of it. And, and, you know, but then you can swing too far and only like try and talk people out of their pain, which is a, a thing that a lot of people think is what it means, which we, it, we know it doesn't, but you know, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's as a therapist, when you accept that there's uncertainty and you just try and reason like based on your, your assessment or based on your, 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 uh, your interview, I think those are, uh, that's what provides you the most information uh, mm -hmm. of kind of some of the, the strategies to, 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 uh, to take with people. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That um, that word uncertainty is interesting. The last year at San Diego, just this last year, um, that's something that I I understood is that is that the people that I really look up to, um, in addition to being a heck of a lot more proficient with the information, <laughs> they are also just more comfortable with the uncertainty. Yeah, and, uh, hey, yeah, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, yeah. okay right? Makes me think of the therapeutic encounter and that uh, if we're cool with the uncertainty and that people are probably going to be okay, if we hold our nerve, then um, that, that you know, translates to the patient as, hey, maybe it will be okay. They don't seem worried at all, right? That whole, like, uh, co-regulation thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just before we move on, I just thought I would put it out there that anybody who's watching who maybe hasn't been on before, if you have a question, please post it in the comments, and we can actually bring your question up on the screen. Um, so if at any point we're talking about something you're not sure about, or if you got a question for Taylor or myself or Eric, uh, post it in the comments and we'll do our best to answer the question as we go. Um, but after that, we'll move on. And, and I think the, the next question we got Taylor is what do you think is the, um, the main purpose of assessment for RMTs? <laughs> It's a loaded question, I know. But. <laughs> the main purpose. Okay, well, speaking with absolutely zero authority on this. Um, well, you've got some authority, so go uh, ahead. I, I certainly do not, but I will tell you what I think. Just this one little brown guy thinks this. Is, um, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. Like, I, I, coming from teaching so many years at West Coast, um, there are a lot, there's a lot of this stuff in McGee Chapter 1. Um and it's amazing how much of it I think wasn't focused on and I think could be focused on, but maybe that's another, um, another conversation. But uh, in McGee, it says in chapter one that the, the process of assessment is to understand the patient's condition from their point of view and to understand it from our point of view. Now, later on I, in my career, in I guess more recent years, I've I focused a lot more on what it means to them. So now I ask people, "What's your understanding of what's happening with you?" And that tells me a lot more uh, important information that I can then act on um, for the therapeutic uh, process. Nice. I think I think the key thing too is, and I, I know from conversations we've had before about you know you, you see right in the chapter one of McGee, and I think it basically says somewhere in there. I'm just going to paraphrase that a good clinical interview basically negates the need for a lot of orthopedic assessments because you'll get all the information you need from having a good structured interview. It does. I can actually I can actually just about quote it, and it says that although a systematic um, examination is important. Uh, and nothing should be skipped. Uh, oftentimes, a good clinician will be able to make a diagno- make a diagnosis by simply listening to the patient. And how amazing is that? Yeah. Like being able to sit and have a conversation because because part of what happens there is that now the patient feels like they're heard, which doesn't happen in other realms uh, like when they go to see other practitioners, whether it's a doctor or other, um, quite often they come up and, and will say to me, like, I feel like you're the pers- first person that's listened to me. Mm-hmm. I haven't been heard at the other places. And yet that's right in the textbook of orthopedic assessment. It is. Basics, man. Chapter one, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so a great little comment here from Sandra Moat, who was one of the people who asked if we could actually do something on assessment. And she said, Taylor, you had next to no questions in your course this past weekend. Good to see you're getting lots tonight. So I don't know if that's just me and Eric and asking the questions or, or what it is, but it, it's great to see that you can uh, fluently answer whatever's thrown at you, buddy. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. And I, I know that you're very well versed in in kind of the the uh, research around assessment. So I mean, the the very purpose of orthopedic assessments is to look to find dysfunction, um, to find a problem in 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 a patient. So you're always looking to find something to fix. 
Now we know that manual therapy doesn't fix anything. We know that basically what we're doing is we are um, providing kind of analgesic or kind of try, hope, hopefully trying to find some self-efficacy for, for a patient. So um, without going into too deep of a dive into the lack of evidence about orthopedic assessments, mm -hmm. what would you... Like how do you have any ideas or strategies on how would you replace a traditional assessment model for musculoskeletal complaints? Like, and what would you replace that with? Yeah, to, to keep within an evidence-informed kind of uh, framework. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know. Okay. So just another disclaimer that I'm just another guy who's like swimming in the dark here. You know. Quit <laughs> being so humble and just talk. Trying to make the best of it, right? So. Oh, <laughs> Oh, right. I mean, like I offer up my my classic Canadian being humble. Why don't you just say sorry before every yeah. comment that you make? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll offer up my information free to anybody and just like tear it apart, make it yours. You know, let's just make it better for everyone, right? So, for me, um, I've taken a lot of notes from the musculoskeletal transitional framework that was done by uh, Tim Mitchell, and um, it's um. It's, I think it's a pretty good little breakdown and I'll share it with anybody. If anybody wants to email me at taylorjames.ca at gmail.com, I'm more than happy to share my charting with you. Um, but one of the things that I think I did at first was I just started asking better questions up front. Uh, I have a four page intake and that saves a lot of time during the interview. Uh, and I'm replacing it to answer your questions. <clears throat> I'm replacing it with um, questions about, you know, what's their understanding of what's going on with them. Because then that gives me an idea of if they have, you know, uh, problematic beliefs that are getting in the way of their recovery, for example, what they like to do, what they wish they could be doing. I ask them questions about what they, um, what they would be doing if they weren't here. I, uh, I now ask people, uh, uh, a question about uh, pick a pick a statement that uh, I'll, I say to them. I'll give you three. I'll give you three statements, and then you can tell me uh, which best reflects the type of relationship you want to have with your massage therapist. I'll say, you know, qu uh, statement number one is basically like, "Get me out of here! I just want to go home. This is getting in the way of my life. I need to be fixed." Kind of attitude, if you know what I mean. Number two would be like, oh, "I have some like recurring sort of things. They don't get in the way of my life." But massage is one of my favorite ways to deal with it. And then number three would be something like, um, you know, life is very stressful sometimes. And I find that massage relaxes me and I feel um, the greatest amount of relief from a relaxation massage, something like that. So I can, so essentially I think that a lot of my questioning is now oriented towards what the patient's idea of help is so I can help them in that way. Very nice. That's excellent. Okay. I like that. So do you still do in your practice, though, do you still do like traditional kind of orthopedic assessments? Do you do, you do a lot of them? Yeah, sure. Sometimes. Well, it depends, yeah. right? Like I think that um, um, I sometimes will use them more often, I think, to show people what they don't have to reassure them, you know? Um, so like, um, it, can I... Uh, I'm going to see if maybe uh, it would be easier for me to tell a, a very quick story with, and hopefully it's not. Oh, give, us, give us a case study, buddy. Yeah. Tell us a story. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. So I did, I did this stuff, kind of stuff all the time, right? So a patient presents with like a right-sided mm. shoulder soreness and her understanding of her condition is that she sprained her AC ligament. Okay. Doing a uh, lat pull downs at the gym. And so uh, first I clear her C-spine, uh, you know, active, passive end passive over pressure. And after the end, I was like, okay, that's great. Nothing there. Your neck is good. Sometimes the neck can refer pain into the shoulder and you don't have that, you know? And uh, then I move on to doing some, I guess you can call it Hawkins Kennedy like sort of testing, but I don't do it in the exact sort of way. I kind of just crank up the shoulder and move it all around and looking for signs of sort of impingement like sort of things. You do the TGL test. Ah, uh, the TJL test. That's yeah. right. <laughs> this is the TJL test. Yes, exactly. 
So anyway, again, it's sort of the same process. I and mean, I know you guys already know what I'm getting at here. It's like, hey, okay, you don't have that either. And then eventually I get towards stuff that's more closer to stressing an ACL via uh, McGee sort of orthopedic assessment, or, uh, traditional orthopedic assessment standards, you know, um, uh, hyper abduction with a little passive overpressure. And then I look at her uh, after it's pain free and I say, hey, that's great. You know, you ain't got nothing going on there. And then I provide like an AC shear test and there's no visible deformity or anything like that. No palpation tenderness over top of the site. And, you know, let her know like, Hey, like if your AC sprain was, if you had an AC sprain, you, you'd, you'd want to punch me in the face for doing that. So, uh, you know, there's no, there's no reason for me to think that you have that right now. And I try and, you know, not step on the, pra- uh, the toes of the other practitioners and let her know like, Hey, this really doesn't look like this right now you know, rather than just, you know, stomping all over what somebody else has said. But in this particular case, it was only like a week old. So it should have been sore if it really was a sprain. And one of the main concerns of the patient was that she couldn't do her um, overhead press. Now, this particular person was a fitness bikini model uh, competitor. And uh, she needed, uh, was very attached to doing her overhead press because she liked the way that it made her shoulders look. And the shoulders were broader and made her waist look smaller. So that was important to her. And then I literally just did this. I was like, can you show me? I mean, I say, can you show me all the time? When people say it hurts with blank. Can you show me? And then they, she showed me and said, yep, that hurts when I do that. And I said, okay. But you can still do and, it. Yo, I literally just did this. How about now? I just moved her into a different horiz- in horizontal plane. And she's like, well, that feels good. I took her out into the kin room. I said, what do you usually press? And she said, 30s. I said, great. Put those in your hands. Bam, bam. The 30s, bang, bang, bang. It's like, as you were. So just a different plane of movement made a massive difference. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. just an activity modification. So I guess that story kind of sums up the way that I would use like assessment as a treatment, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And it works with the BPS, right? It helps her feel strong. Uh, It helps with the self-efficacy. It sort of, in a way, I kind of feel like exercise is a psychosocial intervention because now she's pressing those 30s going like, man, I can still do this. really sprained, like, <laughs> you know? So yeah, yeah. It just makes me happy. And, I, and that stuff happens every single week for me in practice, you know, so. I love it. I think it's really, it's really important though to, to, because people, there's that expectation, right? There's that kind of cultural, societal expectation that when people come see a healthcare provider, we're going to assess them. Right. And people come in oftentimes thinking like, tell me what's wrong. Tell me what's wrong. And then I, then you can fix it. And I think kind of flipping that script to, to show them what is uh, not wrong, but what they can do and what is good with them changes the narrative to focus on the positive, not the negative. Because if you focus on the negative and you're like, oh, yeah, your AC joint is sprained, like you can't do that. Well, then she's going to have that's going to develop fear and kind of behaviors that are going to limit her ability to do those to do the things she really wants to do but you can use assessment knowing that most assessments aren't really that accurate anyway for a specific spot per se and then you can use it to to empower her and 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 get better outcomes And, and and that's i think a really good example to tie back into what we we started with where you don't have to forget all the stuff basically i think differently about how to use it and how to apply it so that's a great story yeah, I like that. Sorry. Examples of that are how, like, we really still need our ortho assessment. Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny because as you talk about this, I just think about a, a call that I went on a couple of weeks ago with the fire department. Um, I went to before this COVID crisis was going, and people were still, you know, out playing sports and things like that. Uh, went to somebody who had been hit at a hockey game and walk into the dressing room, and this young man had a sore shoulder, and I'm able to do you know, compared to your average first responder, because I know about this stuff, able to do some orthopedic tests with them and just go, hey, buddy, you maybe got a first degree AC sprain. Not a big deal. Like your shoulder's okay. You can move it. You can move it. And I'm doing a pulse and I'm like, good, you've got a good strong pulse on that side. And the language that you're using with them is different. And saying, you're okay. This is going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, it the language that we use, I think, is just as important when we're doing those orthopedic tests, um, whether we're in clinic or whether it's me on a fire truck, um, makes a massive difference to those people. And to add to that, I think when we look at the new uh, McGee that has come out, I haven't seen it yet, but apparently the new McGee is very much 
um, talking about specificity versus sensitivity, where most of the orthopedic tests that we've learned aren't really specific to a pathology, but they're just showing a sensitivity in the area that we're assessing. Um, yeah. And the more, especially us as massage therapists, the more that we can go in and calm down that sensitivity, and we do that orthopedic test at the start of a treatment, calm it down and do the orthopedic test at the end that shows it's not as sensitive anymore. It really reinforces what we do. Mm, totally. And you're right about sensitivity versus specificity. And that um, uh, some special tests are pretty good at giving you a true negative, but they're really not good at giving you a true positive. I mean, how many tests are there for uh, can back conditions that are provoked with extension? And then how many tests are there that are extension based tests? I mean, yeah. uh, one test will piss off 20 different back conditions, right? So you still have to rely entirely on your, well, not entirely, but mostly on your history. I'm, I'm thinking history and observation. I, uh, if I use history and observation, I can tell the difference between a disc patient and a, a stenosis patient, you know, and I mean central stenosis. Mm -hmm. So like uh, we should be able to do that instead of just measuring stuff on painful people, because when you just start measuring stuff, you're going to get false positives everywhere. I think that might be one of the fundamental flaws that we, uh, that we have in our uh, traditional approach is just that we just start measuring stuff. All right, I'm just responding to some comments there, so you guys carry on. Okay. Oh, looks like people are having some uh, some technical difficulties. It's I'm uh, yeah. I'm sure there's thousands of people on the internet right now that are slowing things down. So yeah. tell them to get off. <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing is more important. Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention to us. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, your turn, Eric. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I just, I really like that, that the, um, the traditional, the mindset is, is so ingrained in our culture that I think it's, it's, I think it takes these kind of conversations, but like on mass amongst therapists and amongst, um, everybody else to, to really get, uh, to really get, to really, uh, change things and get things moving in the, in the right direction. And, um, I think, uh, I, the Taylor sh uh, shared an article with us called the, uh, which Jamie started off with, with that quote from the beginning said, is it time to reframe how we care for people with non-traumatic musculoskeletal pain? And, and, and there's a couple things there, which, which I really liked. And the, and the, and the authors is uh, Jeremy Lewis and Peter O'Sullivan. And they say a new approach is needed. And, and I really like this because this kind of goes with the whole kind of orthopedic assessment, musculoskeletal care mm -hmm. uh, model and says, we believe there is a need to reframe the way we care for non-traumatic, persistent, and disabling musculoskeletal pain conditions by aligning the management of such conditions with the principles underpinning the management of other chronic conditions. And I, I really like that because so much of, of, of how we're educated and how all manual and movement therapies are, are educated is to, is to look for a dysfunction, to look for a problem, which we assess. We use these orthopedic musculoskeletal assessments. We assess, we assess, we assess, we find a problem, and then we're supposed to fix it. Whereas we know that when things are persistent, uh, and we know that those assessments aren't as uh, accurate as, as they're supposed to be, most of the times they say, it hurts when I do this. It hurts when I do this. Like they don't, they're not as specific to a, a structure always as they're supposed to be, right? Um, and I mean, that's a whole, we could talk for hours about every single test. Uh, but I think that, that, that flipping the, the mentality to start to treat pain as more of a chronic condition, like you would manage diabetes or heart disease mm -hmm. or arthritis rather than trying to fix it, I think would create a huge, 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 uh, shift in, 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 the, in, in, in how, and the quality of care that people provide. And I, I strongly believe that that would, uh, create a much less disability with pain as well. Mm hmm Hmm. That's great. Well, I, I wish we could we could do that because we yeah. need we need something better because we're losing this fight. Like we're not very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> well, do, do you guys remember back in like massage school? Remember we'd like learn all our regional and spinal orthopedic stuff, and you do all these tests, and there, it was basically like, oh yeah, if you if you get positive with this, that means you've got a supraspinatus tendinopathy. If you do yeah. this, you've got whatever name, name your you favorite. Empty, empty empty can and it's a super spinatus tear. Yeah. But yeah. you remember like there was never anything to do about it. You're like, Oh, that's what they have. And they're like, what do you do? Massage it. Correct. Yeah. yeah totally. That was it. It was like, rub it till it feels better. That, and it's in, in, in hindsight, you think that's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. 
Which like, actually leads us into uh, a great question that's been put on here. Hmm. So Natasha says, so this isn't about exercise modification, but about exercise prescription. What are your thoughts about using isometric uh, exercises for Dequervins, Greg Lehman style? So Natasha, I, I think it's actually about both. And, and uh, my two co-hosts here can argue with me if they disagree. I think it's, a, I think it's about both exercise, mod exercise modification, but also using isometrics, concentrics, and eccentrics in order to help our person. Now, I don't know enough about the Quervin syndrome specifically, um, but we typically would use uh, exercise modifications to decrease pain in the area. Uh, and then we can use isometrics, which are also commonly uh, thought of as an analgesic and then using concentrics and eccentrics to build the area back up. Um, so I think there's a couple answers to your question, but uh, those are my answers, but I'll let you two go off uh, about what you think your answers are. We'll let TJ go. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't prepared for a specific question and I, I can't comment specifically about de Quervings because I, I'm not... I'm not prepared for that. I do know that when it comes to tendinopathy, that the vast majority of the research is done in the lower extremity, load which is kind of a bummer. Um, but yeah, like you said, load it. There's a lot of stuff that just, that is kind of like load the hell out of it. Um, I mean, when it comes to uh, what Jamie was saying about, uh, about calming stuff down, I mean, whatever the hell calms it down, who cares? I mean, yeah. who cares? And if it's a, if it's a, if it's a joint mob or, you know, what we call, what we still call fascial release or, or, uh, some kind of activity modification and like Touching people nicely, what the heck's the difference, right? I mean, yeah. it's, all, it's all the same for me as I, I think that when it comes to, um, pathology, uh, that maybe that might be one of our problems with non, non traumatic musculoskeletal disorders is that we're still dis we're still describing them in pathological terms, but if we describe them in descriptive terms rather than ideological, then it becomes, Oh, I see what's going on there, friendo. You've got uh, uh, don't likey bendy forward syndrome. That's <laughs> the problem. It's not, you know, it's not that it's a disc or a tear or a rib is out or something like that. It's just like you can't put your shoes on. Like, and these things are often contextual too, right? I mean, Natasha's question when it comes to the de Quer veins, it'll probably be more associated with a particular activity. I mean, it'll be like patient will be like, what it hurts when I blank. And then that becomes um, the assessment and it becomes the treatment goal as well. I mean, find a way to help people do their things, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah. And I think the, uh, you made a good point there early on TJ about the, um, just load it. Right. So if it, if it's a tendon, if it's a, it, and it's usually easy to tell if it's a tendon because it's sore when you load that tendon, mm -hmm. you just, yeah, the isometrics for it within, within comfort are, 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 are like, that's kind of the gold standard. That's, but like you said, it's, it's all in the lower limb. And so I think we can extrapolate that that's probably going to be the same in the upper limb, but we don't know because there's not a lot of research, but you could say, well, the mechanism, be a bit lighter. Probably, the mechanisms are probably the same, yeah. right? So you would load your, you would load the tendon under, under an isometric load and, 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 uh, you'd probably follow the same principles, you know, the stuff that, uh, Ebony Rio and, uh, Jill Cook, Jill Cook and, and, uh, Craig Purdom, I think, are the, the researchers that have done most of, of that. Great. Try it. See if it works. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so funny enough, one other comment. Uh, Jocelyn says that TJ spot her, taught her spinal, which was the most terrifying three months of her life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Apparently, so sorry. Uh, TJ was a bit of a tough instructor. I saw yeah. her. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Uh, Natasha gives us a response. She says, cool, thanks. The, that's what she figured, loading for even little thumb tendons. 100%, um, Natasha, the more that you can load uh, any tissue, the better. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to have a better response uh, as opposed to just touching and calming things down. The more we can build things back up and load individual tissue, whether it's bone, muscle, tendon, or ligament, I think the more success we're going to have. Mm, and just to add to what Natasha's uh, saying, like I wouldn't, at this point, uh, with my current understanding, uh, I wouldn't worry about loading anything in particular. Like I wouldn't have people doing elastic band yeah. exercises or something like that. Every time you grip something, you're using your hand. So, I mean, just, I would find an, a, a few upper extremity exercises that the patient's comfortable to do. Mm -hmm. And then that's great. 
Yeah. Uh, if I can add to that, I think one of the one of the big things, and I think one of the big reasons that as massage therapists we don't recommend or prescribe exercise is because we're worried that we're not being specific about our exercise. And the reality is, is if you just load the general area, the body is very, very smart and it's going to load the appropriate tissue that needs to be loaded. It's, um, you know, a, a perfect example is Natasha's comment that if we're even loading for little thumb tendons, um, it's really hard to do a very specific exercise for this one little thumb tendon. But if we just load the thumb in flexion or extension, whatever, um, Thing the patient is having trouble with, the body is smart enough to figure out that that's going to be effective. We don't have to do a very specific little tiny movement for this one little tiny area. Yeah. I mean, I had a, a huge exercise bias for a long time. So looking at a lot of exercise research, it's, it's interesting to see how excited we can get about, oh, this specific exercise yeah. is going to help this specific uh, this little tiny thing. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and, um, turns out that it's not really more effective than general exercise, even something as popular as core strength or people are doing these rehab exercises with the rotator cuff or glute bridges or something like that. I, I have a button and this is my bias uh, speaking. I, and I think we're just underloading people all over the place. Like if you can get out of a chair, why are we doing clamshells? It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, sure. it's not honoring the amount of strength. I mean, if you can squat, let's find a squat that you can do. I mean, even if 80% of the squats that we could give you are uncomfortable, that means that there are 20% that are accessible to you and that you feel awesome doing, you know? If you, if it feels good, do it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's my favorite thing is what exercise will you do? Okay. That's your exercise you're going to do. Yeah. Which follows up with two uh, questions that we've got online here. So our buddy Mark Retzlab uh, says, Diane Jacobs is fond of saying manual therapy is always optional, but it can be optimal. Can you describe the set of conditions that massage therapy is well suited for? And are there orthopedic tests or patient history questions that you, that you use to rule people in or out of massage therapy treatment? Taylor. Oh, I see. Passing the uncomfortable one to me first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you're, you're the, the star you're the of guest. this, for yeah. heaven's sake. Let's go. <laughs> Okay. Can you, can you post his question again? So I can do it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I like what Diane said that manual therapy is always optional because I can't, it would be really difficult for me to justify saying that it is necessary at any time. Uh, can I describe a set of conditions that massage therapy will be well suited for? Well, I just think anybody, it, it, I think anybody that responds well to it. I mean, why does one person respond better to acupuncture, manual therapy, osteopathy, chiropractic? I really, I really don't care. I mean, they're, they're the boss of what works best for them. I have people tell me, you know, nothing else works for me except blank. And it doesn't have to be even massage therapy, but we've all met people that say that this thing works for them and it gives them, you know, uh, you know, uh, extraordinary relief, you know, just leaps and bounds beyond everything else. So. Well, that kind of goes back to the, was it our, our last one, Eric, or the one before where we talked about patient preferences and, um, you know, if a patient comes in and their preference is that they get a deep tissue treatment or that they get a chiropractic adjustment or they get this and that, that there is a benefit to that. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I don't think this is counteracting what Taylor just said, but if we can if we can do that interview with the people and find out what's important to them as far as treatment goes and what they enjoy, uh, then we can tailor our treatment around that, uh, which leads in, and I know, Eric, you're going to add something to this, but I just thought I'd throw this uh, question up, uh, or the statement up, is Thomas says one of the hardest things to do is actually getting the patient to do the exercises. Um, so that's where talking to them and finding out what's important to them uh, might actually tailor the exercise that we prescribe and may have more success in getting them to do that thing. But Eric, I know that you're going to have something to say about that, so I'll let you go. Uh, no, I, I really like Mark's question. I think it's it's uh, creates a, a very interesting um, discussion or dialogue. And I think, can you describe a set of conditions that MT is well suited for? I think, well, I think manual therapy of any kind is, is suited for anybody that hurts. If you're in pain, 
regardless of, of, of where or what it is, I think manual therapy can play a role. Um, it may not always be the best thing, but I think if, if you're coming to see a manual therapist, physio, chiro, massage, whatever it may be, I think it, it, the goal of, of, of therapy is to, is to provide some type of analgesic effect. You know, mm -hmm. A manual therapy induced hypoalgesic effect is what you're looking for. And I think the, um, any condition really can, can help with that. I think the only time it may not be is if it's like an acute injury where like there's like obviously inflammation and tissue damage where like something just touching the area might be too extreme, but maybe you can touch a different area far away from it that might that might just calm their overall system. Um, and I would say unless there is like a red flag of uh, like the second part of the question says, are there orthopedic tests or patient history questions that you use to rule people in or out for MT treatments? I would say in the like the 0.1% of cases where there's actually some reason to to not treat them. I mean, that would be something like a um, red flag, cancer. like a red flag, like yeah. you know, maybe there's uh, you know uh, sign tumor of over a site or something. tumor, or they've got um, saddle numbness, you know, from uh, cauda equina or or something, which is so rare. I mean, in however many years, 15, 16 years, I've been, fifteen years I've been practicing, I think I've seen that like once. Yeah, and so. You know, if there's something that doesn't seem right, yeah, don't treat them and send them to the hospital. But I think, for the most part, I think anybody can 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 receive a treatment uh, from what we do or people like us. And uh, at the very least, you're not going to cause harm. Yeah, and I think I'd I'd like to throw something in there because I think there, I think we as therapists were very musculoskeletal uh, focused, but I think there's also a plethora of mental health issues that we can help out with as well. Um, where people are coming in and just want to be touched or they want to have a listening ear that massage therapy can be, can have profound effects for those people. So uh, to back up what Eric was saying, I think there's some additions to that, but I, I think there's very few things that we can't help with. And, you know, if we can rule out those red flags, uh, other than those we're I think there's a lot that we can do to help people. I think we need to stop. I think we need to change change our, our narrative from being the fixer to being the helper. You know, yeah. being more of a of a coach or a facilitator of 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 um, a facilitator of their journey rather than a fixer of their problem. Mm -hmm. I think I think flipping that that narrative around is, is is makes you think differently about your your interactions with patients. And I think that's really important. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, one which interestingly enough, when I look down at the uh, um, research article that we've been talking about. Um, we talk about our approach with people and it says for clinicians, these might be pain beliefs, pain beliefs, professional identity, time, financial pressures, and lack of adequate training uh, when it comes to orthopedic assessment. Um, so really when we're dealing with patients, uh, it can be their pain beliefs, um, their identity and time and financial pressures that either negate or promote them coming in for treatment. So those are all things that we need to take into account as well when it comes to these musculoskeletal incidences that they might be coming in for is, you know, a, fi a financial restraint um, is a massive one for people coming in for treatment, yeah. whether they're getting treatment or not getting treatment. So there's all these things that we need to take into account. And now you guys are silent. Wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you were keep going, Jamie. No, I ju it's just one thing that I highlighted in that research article that I yeah. just thought was applicable there because it's there. There's all these outside factors that we have to take into account um, as to whether it's going to be appropriate for somebody to get massage therapy or not. And one thing I really, I mean, to go back to the research article, one thing that I think is really important, and it can totally confirms my bias. So just because it's confirms it doesn't mean it's wrong, right? But it means I like it a lot more. Yeah. And uh, they basically they allude to the in order to change um, how people with persistent musculoskeletal pain are treated, there needs to be a massive shift in society, and and all the stakeholders need to be involved. And I'm just going to read this here because I really like this. They say in order to achieve this this change and and about getting people to think about chronic pain or persistent pain as being more of a, a uh, managing the same you would manage other chronic diseases or chronic conditions, they say, to achieve this, the efforts of many institutions, including educational, healthcare, political, and professional organizations, health funding bodies, and the media need to be involved. And, and I love that because 
you know, there's, there's little groups of us talking about this and we're just such a small part of the picture, but it needs to be like, you need the people that make the decisions to, to start to, to decide that like the care that we are providing and the, and the things that we are doing and the way we're educating people uh, actually isn't ideal. It's not evidence-based. So we're actually, I think it's ethically, it's wrong. And I think that we need to, we need to take the stuff that we've learned from the past, use that information and adapt it to be uh, more in line with our current understanding. And that just, it's one thing, I mean, we've been saying for years and it just kind of drives me crazy. It's just too damn slow mm -hmm. to, to get there. And, and then, you know, just hearing TJ's stories about, you know, assessment tonight just kind of further emphasizes that like, that's just one piece of the puzzle that can still be used. We don't have to throw it under the bus, but, it, it can be it can be used differently to infer um, positive and strength rather than dysfunction. Mm -hmm. We understand the BPS model. We realize that telling people that they're broken and wrong isn't necessarily the best thing, particularly when as manual therapists, there's nothing we can really do about it. And uh, do you mind if I just jump on that for a yep, sec? Please. Yeah, go. You know, just because the main topic was assessment, you know, and I want to just give people the understanding that we got a great ortho assessment uh, yes. background yeah. and we can still use a lot of these special tests to our advantage, you know, like, uh, <clears throat> for example, somebody comes in and they're like, uh, Oh, I've got really stiff hips. You know, I, I've got really, really stiff hips. I have poor flexibility. That's their internal dialogue. Right. And they think, I oh, know I don't stretch enough giving themselves a hard time for this. We know that the vast majority of the benefits of stretching are in the moving in and of itself. So that's helpful. So we can tell them, hey, pal, like you can let yourself off the hook. If you enjoy it, great. But if you don't want to, then you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And back to the assessment piece, how that fits in with this patient is, is that we can tell them, no, man, it's not that you have very, very inflexible hips. You have very, very stable hips. And isn't that awesome for other things? Or what if somebody had, you know, a, a moderately retroverted femur? Well, you know, they're, they may be wondering in their yoga class why they can't do that stretch where they push their, you know, their knees down. Like this. I wonder that every time I go to yoga. You know what I'm saying, man? So we can look at these people and be like, nah, bro, that's just your hardware. That's cool. Don't worry about it. You're awesome for these other things. That's just not part of your hardware. And that's cool. Like, don't worry about it because I think we have this like one size fits all kind of mentality still when it comes to shaming people about their ranges of motion when in fact anatomical variation is the norm. Length what? of muscles, shapes of joints. So if one, if one, you know, you're doing bench press and one hand likes to look more like this than the other, then like who gives a shit? Like to just like do it because that's what feels good. And if your shoulders are shaped different, we can give people options and say, that's cool that you do it like that. It's okay that your feet are a little further apart than your, than your trainer says is optimum for doing a squat or whatever. Right. So we can still use these orthopedic assessment models that we have to show people, Hey man, your hips prefer to move like this through discovery, you know, of moving together and also through just oh, some ortho assessment stuff, you know, and then give people the confidence to to be uh, uh, assertive for themselves and tell their other professionals, hey, bro, like uh, my hips don't like to do it like that. They actually like it better like this. So we're going to do it like that. You know what I mean? It's great. I love it. That's what we're looking for, TJ. Um, and so for anybody that's watching, I left a link to the article that we've been talking about in the comments. So you should be able to click on that link and download the article if you want to look at it. Uh, one of the things that I loved about this article as well is that at the end of it, it says, if we align our current practice with that supporting the most chronic healthcare conditions. So as Eric's talked about, as Taylor's talked about, if we compare musculoskeletal conditions to things like diabetes and other chronic healthcare conditions, we, we are playing a massive role in this and we should be talking about musculoskeletal conditions and pain being just the same as those other chronic uh conditions and that's a massive way that we can help out you guys got anything to add to that yeah just that that uh it's not just that they belong on the table but that 
but that, you know, if we look at that article and say that the vast majority of non-traumatic musculoskeletal disorders don't have a pathoanatomical diagnosis that adequately explains disability and pain and understanding that that is the majority of what we see, musculoskeletal conditions are the single most costly healthcare burden that we have. It's yeah, pain is devastating. Yeah. So it's not just that we belong in the arena. I mean, low back pain alone, just the costs tower over all cancers and cardiovascular disease combined. So it's not just, Hey, we belong at the table. It's like, we need specialists, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a comment from Natasha again, uh, she says sort of along the lines of what is being discussed now about decision makers not understanding evidence-based manual therapy and also the comment above, quoting Diane Jacobs, manual therapy is always optional, but it can be optimal. The fact that chiropractors are currently considered essential service, while RMTs are not, sort of continues the public perception of manual therapy, in this case chiro, being somehow the thing that's going to fix you. Just thoughts I had on my, uh, while on my run. Um, yeah. From what I've understood recently, people have a lot of profound thoughts while they're out on a run. Um, <laughs> so Natasha is one of those people as well. I'm going to have to try running a bit more to see if I can have some profound thoughts. Um, <laughs> but Natasha, I, I think that's, yeah. you know, with the COVID epidemic and everything that's going on right now, um, I get the feeling that the reason that's happening is because of some lobbying as opposed yeah. to uh, factual. Thing yeah, and, I, I, and I would say too, based on uh, my business partner, Richard, who the he's a chiropractor, he was saying that they're national, they have a national association, right? Who is lobbying like, uh, pardon me? Not a provincial like us. Yeah. So they're, they're they have a national, yeah. like all, all, and, and they are lobbying like crazy right now to keep Cairo's part of uh, basically keeping them employed. Yeah. Unlike us where we're all, we don't have that same lobbying power. So it just goes with what you're saying, Jamie, is that um, it, it really comes down to uh, who's behind us. Yeah. And I, and, and our college is just, they're going based on the recommendations that uh, were not essential necessarily. And, and we just got to sit, sit tight and wait. Yeah. And I, I, and I think just to respond to that as somebody who is part of essential service is that mm, physio chiro rmt none of us are essential service right now no. um so Nobody is. uh I, all i would say to that is that the rmt profession as a whole across the country is taking the right approach as much as it hurts as much as none of us are making a living right now with what we do um we're taking the right approach because the only way we're going to stop this epidemic is by staying home and not spreading it so uh, if any of you are Kairos that are watching, which is doubtful, I hope that you take the same approach and start to shut down your practice and stay home so that we can get ahead of this thing. That's just my two cents. I agree. I never, th I've never thought once in my career that what I'm doing is saving lives. So I, I it's hard, it's hard to, <laughs> you know, it's hard for us to, to justify like musculoskeletal pain. We can make people feel better, but you know, I think based on all the unknowns with this pandemic, we don't really know, right? Um, like if somebody comes in and they're asymptomatic, oh, Jamie's Excuse got it right now. I got COVID. And, yeah, and they're and they're asymptomatic. We don't know, right? So maybe yeah. maybe they have it, and then maybe we get it, and we bring it home to our our kids and our our, our spouses or our family, and then they go out. Like it's, we don't know enough. So I think it's you know right now erring on the side of caution is great. So I think the fact that there is some people still working, thinking that they're essential in our field is. I don't know, unless you've got all the proper gear, I think it's 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 pretty risky based on all the unknowns. Well, don't look at me. I just the board. I can't touch that one with a 10-foot pole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm just responding to comments so you guys can keep yeah. uh, carrying on. I guess does anybody else have any other questions? Because usually this thing finishes with a handful of questions of people that are kind of holding back. Uh, well, just a comment from Mark. Let me finish a comment here. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, Mark's comment. Um, oh, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted this one. Uh, Mark says he heard about a Cairo who was staying open solely to triage accidents. Give them an x-ray, make sure they're negative and send them home. Um, as somebody who's trained in triaging accidents, I can confidently tell you that a Cairo should not 
be trying to triage an accident uh, unless they're trained as a first responder. They they have no business doing anything like that uh, because triaging an accident has nothing to do with taking an X-ray. Triaging an accident has to do with looking at people who you can help right now and the people who, if you gave them five minutes attention, wouldn't make it. So a, a Cairo triaging and doing x-ray is not going to do anything for an accident. So uh, whoever that is, he's marketed them, marketed themselves very well, but they're not, they have nothing to do with triage. So that's all I can say to you, Mark. I love you, buddy. Uh, so that Cairo was wrong. <laughs> Blatant. I, I don't, yeah. if they want to yeah. contact me and, and challenge me on it, that's fine. I'll go through yeah. and explain to them what triage is, but a Cairo triaging with x-ray is there. It, it's no such thing. So they're wrong. And now I'll probably have the college of chiropractors and <laughs> contact me and tell me that I'm an idiot or whatever else, but that's fine. I have no problem with that. Uh, so Mark says that, uh, Preventing people from going to the ER is one of the main justifications chiro chiropractors are using to stay open at this time. There's nothing that a chiropractor can do to diagnose uh, COVID. That it, it, I don't know what else to say about that, and I could go off on it for probably an hour. Uh, <laughs> but they're, sorry, I have friends that are chiropractors, and I love them, uh, but there's nothing uh, that they're doing that's going to make any difference there. Uh, and yes, Mark, I, I realize you're not saying it's right at all. You're just highlighting what's going on in the country. Um, and they shouldn't be doing that because that, no, no. Anyways, uh, that's gone off the topic of <laughs> doing orthopedic assessment. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I could go on that for another hour, but uh, I don't think we need to. Uh, but I love the comments, Mark, and, and thanks for partaking. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mark. Does anybody else who's listening in right now have any more questions, especially around orthopedic assessment, uh, pain science stuff for Taylor, Eric, or myself? Uh, and we'll just give it, getting a few more likes coming up on the page. Uh, great comment from Dietria. She says, thank you so much for what you shared, Taylor. You've, confer you've confirmed her bias that skill and confidence assessment is still important and still has a value in the BPS model. Really appreciate you guys sharing your time. Um, ah, oh, Dietria, no problem. Yeah, we we all love Dietria, and if anybody who's listening in doesn't know Dietria, you should add her as a friend because she's uh, she's brilliant. Uh, she's a lovely person, and uh, she has the best laugh I've ever heard. If and if you could watch an episode of Big Mouth with her, you, <laughs> my goodness, you would laugh for a year if you could listen to that laugh. It's amazing. Uh, and Sandra says, uh, "Thanks, guys. Really enjoyed three different perspectives. Um, Great. I hope there. I hope our perspectives weren't that different because I think we all agree uh, a lot on what we talk about. But uh, we're just confirming our biases again. So, uh, <laughs> Dietria. Oh my God, Big Mouth. <laughs> yeah, phone Dietria and watch Big Mouth with her." I'll throw uh, one more thing in the in the ring, if that's okay with you, gents. A hundred percent. It generates more conversation with us, or for book for after, or whether it just generates more questions for uh, another time. But um, I think one of the things that we never really did was asked ourselves when assessment was indicated, like when more assessment was indicated. So, I mean, you know, if you wear if you wear glasses, right? you don't get tested first, you get screened. And if you fall below a certain cut, then they start testing you. So I think in a lot of ways, our case history has that value of screening. And then at that like threshold, it should be, I'm trying to get my fingers right here on the, on the, on the screen. So it should be like, if you reach a certain threshold, then it should trigger another set of assessments. And then if you reach that threshold, then it should trigger another set of assessments. But for the vast majority of people, I mean, they've got like, what, don't like you lift your shoulder syndrome. And then what do you, what's your job is to just help them be able to lift their shoulder and do the things they need to do and then calm shit down and build shit back up. It's, it's really not that it's really not that complicated. I think the vast majority of patients that, uh, that we see do not require detailed orth orthopedic assessment at all. Nice. 
And I think that I, I've taken some flack for that because I know some people will will say they'll they'll throw a, st- a, a straw man style argument in there and say I can't believe you're not gonna do like a full Hopner's or you're not gonna do a full you know assessment. It's like, bro, my assessment's already done. You I know, there's no it. reason that I should continue because the information that I'm going to get is not going to be helpful to the rest of my treatment. And I'd I'd love to unpack the crap out of that with anyone who wants to have a more Uh, at length discussion with me about that but for the most part i mean that's what it is right that's Mm -hmm. that's at least that's what i'm thinking anyway that's why i designed assessment courses because i want rmts to feel confident that if you do a certain amount of screening that the vast majority of our patients don't require uh further detailed assessment and then they can just hit the table and enjoy massage nice i love it so simple it's all about making things simple right yeah a couple comments we got from uh sarah baker Thank you, Taylor, for being so open to talk, and Jamie and Eric for continuing to do this. Loving them. Bring me back to San Diego Pain Summit. <laughs> if any of you listening can go, meet us at the San Diego Pain Summit. Do it. Uh, and then another comment, Thomas. I, I like that. Mark started telling people I'm here to help to calm shit down and build shit back up. Yo, that's not me. Thomas, Make sure you quote Greg Lehman on that, that because that's the Greg Lehman thing. But Thomas, I've been telling you that <laughs> for the last year. Uh, <laughs> apparently, we need to have a, con- a conversation offline. Uh, but I love it, buddy. Yeah. A hundred percent. Keep telling your people that. Uh, and then Tasha again says, I agree, Taylor. What are times when a more detailed orthopedic assessment is required? Oh, shit. Um, well, if somebody has nerve signs, I mean, that's the most common one that I see. And then after that, um, again, uh, just as McGee suggests, the first thing that we have to do is rule out radiculopathy and then move on from there to the periphery. Mm-hmm. Nice. Great. Uh, Natasha, I hope that answers your question. And then a great comment from Jennifer Campbell. If you haven't taken Taylor's assessment course, take them. Do and it. We all agree. We all agree. Thank uh, you. <laughs> I think we're, I'm not getting any new comments coming in, but I think that's a great way to end this is if you haven't taken Taylor's course, take it. Um, and we'll continue to work together with Taylor on some things. Um, Taylor, we can't thank you enough for coming on tonight. Um, oh, yes. Love, love to talk to other, other, other therapists that are doing great things in our community, um, and you are doing great things in our community, uh, educating other therapists and doing it with a biopsychosocial view. Uh, keep, keep doing the great work that you're doing, and let's keep working together. And let's keep building things up so that. Um, other therapists are going to be better because everything that you're doing right now is making other therapists better. And we can't thank you enough for that. Ah, Thanks, Jens. You too. Absolutely. Thanks, TJ. No problem. All right. Everybody who's listening in, uh, if you want to continue to post questions uh, in the comments, uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, We'll forward them to TJ if he doesn't see them. And if not, uh, we really appreciate you listening in tonight. We'll try to keep these going. Um, and if you have anything that you would love to talk about or things you would love for us to talk about, uh, post it in the questions and we'll try to do our best with that. Um, if there is something that you are a pro at, please reach out to us because we would love to have you on here uh, to talk about it because this is all about sharing information, especially while this whole pandemic is going on. Uh, we want to share as much content as we can so that when we go back to work, we're all better practitioners and helping our patients even more. Uh, Eric, it looked like you were just about to say something. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you don't even have to be a pro. It's no. an area of interest or something you really want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, reach out and, and we'd love to have you on because it doesn't have to be, we're not looking for everybody that's like, uh, that has an extra special body of knowledge, but it's maybe something you just want to talk about or something that's important to you, or maybe there's some uh, research articles or something that, that, that you find interesting and important, then reach out and we'd love to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Taylor, you got anything to add? No. And, you know, um, you guys were kind enough to bump me and no doubt I'd say it in my courses. I'm like, you guys are doing great work too, man. Massage Therapy Development Center, like what up and Achieve Health. You guys are doing a great job. And I always say that I think it's super important that we have RMTs that are using our language yeah. and talking about our context because our yeah. context totally different than physios and chiros. I mean, the information, yes, there's a lot of information that's transferable, but it doesn't always fit into our context. So 
you guys are doing awesome work by staying at the forefront of that. And we need to translate that into massage therapy practice. So good on you. Thanks, buddy. Hey, yeah, we, thanks. We agree. RMTs should, or massage therapists should try to learn from massage therapists. So I think we'll uh, bring it to an end right there. Thanks, everybody, for listening in tonight. Uh, we love having you on. Love that you would come on and listen to us. Um, keep doing the great work that you're doing when we get back to work. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks.